Thanks very much. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I feel very honored and privileged to have been invited to speak to you this morning, and I'd like to thank you very much for the invitation. Um, the purpose of my presentation uh, this morning is to share more than 20 years of experience in designing, developing, and building an operational excellence system which achieves high levels of employee engagement and therefore delivers continuously improving levels of service and performance. Now, to find out what was important to you, we've done a lot of research amongst your colleagues and also looked at our experience in working closely with some committed and dedicated individuals in the health sector. Um, we're going to hear what they have to say about working with us at the end of my presentation. So, we know that it's important for you to save 20 billion pounds over the next few years. We also know that you all care about delivering improving levels of quality in healthcare and recognize that it has to be achieved at ever-reducing levels of cost. Now, we all know you can't instruct people to become engaged. You have to lead them. You have to inspire them. You have to show them. You have to illuminate what's possible. You have to explain, and you have to do it every hour of every day. It's called leadership, but that's not enough. To truly engage people, you need what I would describe as a design system that explicitly links not just a suite of tools and techniques, but a whole philosophy of working to the key steps which commence the employee engagement journey. Here's the parallel with what I've learned about implementing the Unipart way throughout my operating companies, and more recently in our branch network, and with clients and business partners around the world. To be truly successful and achieve high levels of performance through engaged people, it is critical to have available all of the tools and techniques and then engage in deliberate practice under a great coach. He or she will signpost the appropriate tools to be used at the appropriate time as part of the day job. Ladies and gentlemen, the world is littered with failed lean implementations because it looks easy, but it's not. So what I've learned uh, that I think may be helpful to you. Firstly, unambiguous leadership from the top. Second, a definitive world-class body of knowledge. Third, a place to see it all working. Fourth, a great architect or sensei to work out what to do and where and when to do it. Next, someone who can constantly tell you which tools to use in which sequence and help you make progress at the right speed. Next, an integrated system of tools that work together like a symphony rather than a range of disconnected initiatives, which although they may deliver short-term results, generally crash and burn shortly afterwards. You need guides by your side to coach in the moment, because what you need to do is often counterintuitive, but if you fail to do it correctly, it's easy to get stuck and disheartened. You need to set deadlines and demanding targets, and put time and effort into supporting those that are struggling to cope technically and emotionally, but are committed. But equally well, and here's the controversial bit, those that are determined to frustrate progress at every turn must be moved on and out and be seen to be. By the way, that's generally not the people on the shop floor. Now, I know that many of you feel under pressure to achieve quick wins, and we know how to do that as well. But in my view, unless these are part of the system that creates genuine employee engagement and builds capability for what we call problem solving at your own level and embeds the foundations for a culture of continuous improvement, the grass will grow back and all the savings will be lost. Ladies and gentlemen, we all know the British people love the health service and we all want it to be around for ourselves and for our children in the years ahead. 
there will, of course, be new advances in drugs and technology which may save costs or sometimes even increase costs. But I understand that about 80% of the cost of running the health service are for people and administration, with about 20% accounted for for drugs. I can tell you with complete confidence that the cost-saving targets and the productivity improvements which are necessary can be achieved if, and only if, you're willing to make the commitment to implementing an operational excellence system and take on the demanding personal leadership challenge which that implies. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to share some of our experiences with you today. I've enjoyed the opportunity and I want to thank you for giving me such an attentive and courteous hearing. I know you've got some questions and I'd be happy to try and answer them. Thank you very much indeed. We've just got about five minutes for questions, so let's get the house, mic, house lights up and the mics out, but I'm going to kick things off because what struck me, and I know you had at the end those examples of uh, people within the NHS who yes. are looking at the Unipart way, but you've got a group of people here who are not only, I mean, there's not the sort of, you know, the 20 billion pounds efficiency, they've also got this incredibly uneven landscape. And when you talk about there was a, the unambiguous leadership from the top, they've, they've got multiple bosses because they've got politicians as well and a situation where there is uncertainty. And the, you know, goodness knows in a few months, the direction of travel has, may have changed, <laughs> we're still not entirely sure, um, and may change yet again. And I wonder when you've got such an uncertain landscape and you've got, you've got a lot of anger, you've got demoralized managers, how you can, could even think about this now, or that sort of approach, whether yeah. it isn't a case of just wait, see what happens, let the dust settle, then do it. <laughs> it's a great question, um, and, and, not an easy, and not an easy question to answer. But I mean, maybe the best way to, to think about it is that the Unipart way is a politically agnostic system. So whatever the politicians or the managers decide they want to achieve, engaging with the Unipart way system will help everybody in that organization or that institution get on the path to delivering better quality and reduced cost and actually relish coming into work. Even if and you don't can, know how the system is and the structures course, are going to change. Of course. It's, you, know, you can still apply it. Of course you can because, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen in the market tomorrow. New competitors come in, com you know, competitors change, customers change their requirements. The system can be applied in any reasonable sized location. Okay, last one for me then. What's the first thing you would do? And I know it's a difficult question because you've got the NHS with all the various things. If there was one thing you went, you were called in by the NHS to do, you and, and okay, John, come in. Here's the whole of the NHS. Apply lean, apply the Unipart way. Is there something, what, what would be the starting point? <laughs> You're supposed to ask questions that are answerable. I mean, this is like, how do you boil the ocean? Um, I mean, in, the, the NHS is a vastly complex institution. You know, redesigning it from the top, we could talk about a lot, but then I'd need an hour. Um, what would I do if I went in? I'd find a trust or a large-scale institution that really wanted to have a go, and I'd go and implement it there. I'd get their top people to come to Unipart to see. I'd bring staff from every level to come and see. I'd surround them with lots of our people to help them and we'd go and get some results. Um, and then you'd go and have a look and see, wow, this works, this works. And you know, then people line up and say, can we have some of that as well? Microphone number four, please. Thank you. David Rose, I lead Prime Care, which is part of the Saga Healthcare Group. We provide primary care services to the NHS. You focused a lot on staff engagement. We're effectively part of the supply chain of healthcare services to the NHS. What's your experience within, within Unipart and more widely about the best way to engage suppliers in this great mission and in our context the mission of saving 20 billion pounds well that's a great question and maybe i could sort of answer it at different levels because clearly improving the supply chain can achieve massive cost reductions so who are the best in the world at this the japanese car industry and the reason they're the best in the world at it is that they've built very high levels of trust between them and their suppliers. They have very highly skilled professional people who work with the suppliers to set demanding but achievable targets. 
they share information continuously because it's by sharing the data in a trusting environment that you can see the waste. I mean, we know 95% of what happens in the supply chain doesn't add value for the customer. The price is enormous, but you can only get it if you can share data at every level, see where the waste is, and work together to eliminate it. So where's the large-scale example of it working, and where's the large-scale example of it failing? The American auto industry was trying to go that way, and then they got in trouble and they decided the best solution was to go and beat the suppliers to death, force cost reductions that were unachievable, didn't care whether the suppliers succeeded or failed, and didn't have the, the technical capability to really set demanding but achievable targets. So what was the result? Well, the result was the top 10 American component manufacturers almost all went into Chapter 11. And two of the most iconic car makers in the world went bust. That was because they ran this adversarial system, which failed. At the same time, in the, competing in the same global markets, you know, Honda and Toyota and others worked in partnership, very demanding, to continuously improve quality, cost, and delivery. And they made profits, and they grew, and they're successful. That's kind of big picture evidence of what you know, works in one system versus the other. Is there anything that we can't do that they do? No. In fact, we developed 20 years ago our 10 to 0 supplier partnership program. And we have overwhelming evidence that when we have good, competent people working with suppliers in trusting environments, we take massive amounts of cost out for mutual advantage. And the reason it's important for the supplier is that by working with us, they become very, very good. So when it comes to renew the contract, why would you want to go to anyone else? We trained each other to be very, very good at what we do. So no one else can actually go and genuinely be more competitive. So it genuinely is win-win, but it's really hard to do. It is very, very hard to do. Last final question, microphone one. Uh, hi, uh, Phil Hoff, Carer Consultant, Mental Health Network. I just wondered really how you ensure the voice of patients or service users and carers in the Unipart way, and do you think that's a doable thing? Uh, that's a great question. Thank you for asking it. The Unipart way ensures the voice of every participant in the supply chain through what we call our communication cells, where you work out the quality, cost, and delivery metrics that are important to the people in that process, whether they're the patients, the carers, the nurses, the doctors, whatever they are. Um, and the best way would be to come and have a look at one of our comm cells. Um, it's very simple when you see the data, but it's intellectually very demanding to make it highly relevant to all of the people in the process, which is why you need a lot of experience. But if you can, you can absolutely answer up to the issue which you raise, which is very important. Are the patients the equivalent of your customers? Yes, because you need to understand what is it you're trying to achieve for the patient, and then you work out what metrics you need to achieve that, and then you measure it. So you could put in caring as a metric? Well, I, don't, I don't think you can put in caring because caring is not precise enough. You'd have to, you'd have to kind of disaggregate caring. What does caring mean? Oh, let me give you a, uh, I'm, I wouldn't, I'm not going to go there because I'm not an expert in caring. But when we put it into our company restaurant, I said to the chef, what matters? And he had a whole lot of metrics which didn't matter. And I said, well, what really matters to the people that are coming to pick the food up is the quality, cost, and delivery. So how do you measure quality? Is it warm? Is it tasty? Does it look good? Those are the things you have to think about that matter to the person who's buying the food. And then you have to measure it. And you have to continuously improve it. So in caring, you'd have to say, well, what are the components of caring? Can I describe clearly what they are? And then can I measure them? And then can I harness the talent and the expertise of the people who do it to make it better all the time? And you can. And again, I'd be happy to take on the challenge and prove it to somebody. Ladies and gentlemen, John Neal. Thank you.